Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are to all of you. Uh, this is a webinar uh, in the International Research Webinar Series from the uh, Sydney University China Study Centre. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the centre. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the lands of the original inhabitants of um, the university on which the university now stands, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. Uh, we recognize their rights to their land, their traditions of their elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to hand over in a minute to Professor Ying Jie Guo, who's Professor of Chinese Studies, also here in the university and Deputy Director of the Centre, to introduce uh, today's speaker and to um, uh, chair and moderate the discussion. Before we start, though, can I say on a personal note how pleasing it is to have Daniel Bell talking to us in this series. Uh, he is one of the world's leading political theorists of China, probably, if not the, and uh, it's a great honour to have him here. Uh, we last met in China, but as I just found out today, he's off to Hong Kong to a new chair of political theory, which is also very exciting. Over now to Ying Jie Guo. Thank you very much, David. Good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to introduce to you Professor Daniel Bell, who is Chair Professor of Political Theory with the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong. He has recently completed a five-year term as the Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University Qingdao campus. His latest book is The Dean of Shandong to be published by Princeton University Press uh, next year. His books um, are many and include just hierarchy, uh, the China model, China's new Confucianism, beyond liberal democracy, East meets West, and the spirit of cities. Uh, all these books are published by Princeton University Press. He is the founding editor of the Princeton China series, uh, which translates and publishes original and influential academic works from China. And his works have been translated in 23 languages. In 2018, he was awarded the Hui Lin Prize and was honored as a cultural leader by the World Economic Forum. In 2019, he was awarded the Special Book Award of China. And if I can summarize in my own terms, uh, I would like to say one thing. If you asked me, who do you think is the most inspiring political philosopher working in contemporary China today? I would say Daniel Bell. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Daniel. I'm looking forward to what you're going to say about the revival of Confucianism and communism in contemporary China. Well, thank you, Professor Guo. That was very kind. And thank you, Professor Goodman. It's, it's, I'm very, very happy and honored to be invited by the China Studies Center. Um, and I should say that I'm now traveling in Montreal, which is my hometown. I spent three years in China during the uh, whole COVID times. Um, so um, this, it feels a, a little bit strange to talk about China while being in Montreal, but let me, let me do my best. And I haven't prepared a PPT because it's a new topic and I want, I'm not 100% sure that it'll work, but let me try and I'm more than uh, welcome um, critical feedback. I want to put us back a little bit in time to the 1980s, at least when I first started learning about China. And I think many intellectuals, at least outside of China, maybe had a similar view that it seemed like China was going to reform according to the kind of political model set by the United States. It would become a democratic country in the form of one person, one vote, and perhaps other forms of democratic practices. And it would also become capitalist, a bit like the West and other um, so-called advanced countries. Um, 
And it seemed like it was just a matter of time that China would move towards those standards. You know, in 1980s, the idea that China would be, in, or that Chinese intellectuals, government officials, and others would be inspired by Confucian values would have seemed very, very odd, frankly. I mean, it's, of course, we know about the Cultural Revolution, which was an attempt to stamp out traditional culture. Um, but the mainstream tradition of the 20th century in China was really the tradition of anti-traditionalism. Confucianism and other traditional value systems were viewed as backwards looking and to move on to a new modern society, we needed to uh, move beyond those feudal, patriarchal, uh, et cetera, uh, value systems. 1980, something else happened and Marxism too seemed like a kind of backwards uh, system, you know, because of the, again, maybe the bad experience of the Cultural Revolution, which pitted uh, people against each other in often excessively cruel ways. Um, and according to some sort of idea that people were class enemies, Marxism itself was viewed, at least not officially, but certainly by intellectuals and by reformist members of the government as a kind of, you know, again, somewhat archaic value system that would no longer be appropriate for China's future. Now, it's quite remarkable that what has happened since then is that both traditions have made a remarkable comeback. I'm going to describe that a little bit, try to explain it, and then say some highly tentative uh, claims about the China's political future. Let me first say a little bit about the Confucian comeback because that happened earlier. Um, the Marxist comeback, as we're going to see, is a bit more recent. Now, Confucianism is a very diverse tradition um, and it's very hard, I mean, to pin it down to its kind of essential characteristics. So I'm going to simplify it a little bit. I mean, it's a very old tradition, at least 3000 years old. You know, Confucius is just one, obviously the most influential member, but one member of the, of the tradition in Chinese, Rujia makes it more clear that it's a very old tradition that predates Confucian, Confucius himself, Kongzi in Chinese. Um, and since the past 3000 years, it's been combined with Taoism, with legalism, with Buddhism, more recently with liberalism and with feminism and, and democracy. Um, but at its core, I, I still think there's some kind of um, core commitments that let's say, that transcend all the differences. And the first is that the good life according to the Confucian ethic lies in nourish, nourishing harmonious social relations with valued and loved ones and loved ones, with valued members of the community and loved members of the family. And it starts with the family, this kind of the pursuit of harmony and extends outside of the family. The further you extend, Maybe the less intense the love and the fewer the responsibilities. But the point is that we should learn from morality within the family and try to extend some of that love and care and humaneness, ren in Chinese, to outside family members. Um, and that's a constant quest. It doesn't end. It's, a, it, it's not like, I mean, some traditions like arguably Christianity, where you have this kind of sudden illumination or faith. That doesn't happen in Confucianism. It's a constant pursuit of the good life, constant quest for self-improvement. And no matter how diverse tradition, the tradition, there's very little about the afterlife. So it's very much a kind of this worldly ethic. And the so that's the good life. What is the best life? The best life, again, it's contested, but I'm going to present the dominant interpretation, lies in serving the community as a public official. And public officials are supposed to be chosen according to meritocratic standards. That is those who have highest ability, nung, and highest morality, xian, should be selected and promoted. And they have the obligation to serve the public community. And that lies, that's really the best life in, according to the Confucian ethic. And it helps to explain why throughout China's, uh, certainly imperial history, and even more recently, the idea that public officials and bureaucrats are, are viewed in such high regard comes arguably more from the Confucian value system than from Marxism or liberalism or any other 
uh, value system. Now that's been institutionalized in different forms, of course, most famously through the uh, Keju, the kind of imperial examination system, which has about a 1,300 year history, but more or less through, that's been one form, but there's been many forms. It's basically a complex bureaucratic system, which has a over 2000 year old history, which aims to select and promote officials, public officials with superior ability and virtue. Now, one reason why Marxism took such hold in China 20th century, even though often it was viewed as anti-Confucian, but some of the Marxist values actually resonated very well with older Confucian values. For example, the idea that the main obligation, or the first obligation of the government anyway, is to alleviate poverty or to secure basic material well-being. I mean, that's of course both a Marxist and socialist idea, but it's also a Confucian idea. It goes way back to Kongzi and Mengzi, Mencius, and you know himself, who Mencius was very clear that it's for most people, except for very exceptional uh, exemplary persons or Junzi, for most people, it's very hard to be moral if they're lacking basic material welfare. So the first task government is to provide for basic material welfare for the people. Of course, that's not sufficient. It's a necessary condition. And beyond that, um, it's very important for the government to be led. Uh, this is a kind of marxist leninist tradition by a kind of avant-garde, by a kind of minority of you know, public officials who are more enlightened than the majority. Now that resonates with a much older tradition too of Trinze, exemplary persons who are, who are there to serve the community as public officials. Arguably, that's one reason why some of the Marxist values became so dominant in China because they resonate with the older Confucian uh, values. Okay, still, it's quite remarkable that the Chinese Communist Party itself almost uh, formally embraced Confucianism as a leading uh, value system. Certainly it was very clear in the value system that was meant to be shown to the rest of the world in the opening ceremony of the 2008 Olympics uh, when the Confucian themes were highlighted over and over again. The, the value of he, which we can trace as diversity and harmony was, 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 was portrayed as the dominant value in China that, that China should be proud of and arguably um, export to the rest of the world. There's nothing about Marx in the 2008 uh, Beijing Olympics. Um, of course, we know about the Confucian Institutes that, that were exported throughout China, but even within China, many of the um, Communist Party schools were teaching more and more Confucianism. And it's certainly in, in primary and secondary schools, Confucianism and other uh, traditional value systems were taught more and more in, in uh, Chinese educational systems to the point that, at, and here, of course, it seems a bit silly in retrospect, but I could write with all due seriousness in a book published in 2008 that the CCP would be, would be relabeled as the Chinese Confucian Party. And um, you know, why did the Chinese Communist Party want to adopt uh, Confucianism, if not replace uh, Confu C communism with Confucianism? Well, one obvious reason is that communism lacked, we can call ideological legitimacy. It's the, some sort of value system that was supposed to inspire communist party members and the people at large. And there's a need for more legitimacy within traditional value systems with Confucianism at its core. But I want to emphasize that the revival of Confucianism was not just driven by the government. It was very much driven also by intellectuals. I mean, I just give you one example, Jiang Qing, who's a very famous political uh, Confucian in mainland China. He has his own uh, Confucian school, which is funded um, privately by his uh, friends, I guess. Um, you know, he learned about Confucianism in the Cultural Revolution. He was supposed to read the great texts of Confucianism in order to denounce it. But when he read, he said, hey, that's not so bad. In fact, it's quite inspiring. And once he had the chance to, uh, to promote Confucianism, then he did so. So uh, there's been an explosion of academic research on Confucianism 
And it's one of the few areas where, as, as we know, there's been an increased censorship in China of late, but arguably the debates about Confucianism are still very rich and diverse and not as subject to censorship as other areas. Um, so you have periodicals um, like uh, uh, um, like we can translate as Confucius Research, which are very prestigious forums for the publication of essays on Confucianism. Now, why did that come about? Again, I think it's just because the tradition itself is so rich and diverse and watch once intellectuals read it and engage with it, then they realize, wow, this is beautiful. And, and there's a lot to learn here and also to be proud of. But also many intellectuals in China are using Confucianism to think about how to reform the Chinese political system and to make it in a more humane way and relying less on uh, repression. You know, arguably there's two dominant political traditions in China. One is Confucianism and one is legalism, Fa Jia. And Fa Jia says that we should rely much more on uh, harsh punishment and fear to control people. Um, whereas the Confucians say, well, we should rely much more on what we call today soft power, uh, humaneness, uh, 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 education, a moral example, a ritual, and so on. Now, um, I should say, though, that, of course, there's also economic reasons that explain the revival of Confucianism. And one is just that, well, hold on a second. In the 1990s, and more recently, intellectuals look at what are the countries that have developed of late, and the ones that have developed of late while preserving some sort of social order um, more than other countries are East Asian countries with a Confucian heritage. Um, South Korea, uh, Japan, um, uh, 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 Singapore, and so on. Um, so there's much more of a re reevaluation of this view in the 20th century that Confucianism was a kind of reason for China's poverty. In fact, some of the key Confucian values, like an, this worldly uh, outlook, a concern for future generations and for and for savings and so on, actually, and of course, strong emphasis on education because of this value of self-improvement actually contribute to economic development rather than undermine it. There's also a view that as countries modernize, they become more proud of their, of their traditions. I mean, it's not just in China, you know, in many other parts of the world, you know, including India, as they modernize and develop economically, far from being becoming more anti-tradition, they become more sympathetic to tradition. And, and they also, and there's more questioning before. It's not just about making money. Once you make money, what do you do? What provides meaning in life? And intellectuals tend to look to uh, traditions um, that, uh, that, 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 are, that provide a meaning of life. In this case, Confucianism, which says that the meaning of life lies in valued uh, social relations. Okay. That's at a certain point, the tradition, the high point of the revival, arguably, was 2013 when President Xi Jinping visited Xufu, which is the hometown of Confucius himself. And he was handed two books about uh, Confucianism. And he said, I'm going to study these diligently. At that point, many people, including many people that I know well, thought, okay, we're very, very close to the official adoption of Confucianism as a guiding political ideology of China. That didn't happen actually. And more or less, the Confucian comeback has stalled since then. I think it's stalled since then, of course, partly because some of the uh, elderly cutters trained in the Maoist kind of anti-Confucian tradition still exercise political power. It's also because liberals in China often are not fully persuaded by Confucianism is still viewed as a kind of relic from the past. Uh, minority groups are not often very sympathetic to Confucianism. Um, so there's still a long way to go to make Confucianism as a kind of guiding ideology in China. That said, in Shandong province, province of more or less 100 million people, where I served as dean for five years until very recently, I think Confucianism is still very much viewed as the most important uh, tradition in China, not just for the past, but for the present and for the future. I mean, China, let's think of it as a continent, which is very, very diverse. And the kind of motor of the Confucian revival is, is arguably Shandong province. Also where Confucius himself 
because in those days it was in the warring states period, it was called, uh, he was from Lu Guo, which is one of the uh, small states in the warring states, well, in the spring and autumn period. And still today, the license plate in China on all cars have the character for Lu, um, which shows, and if you take, for example, Shandong Airlines, um, on above every seat, there's a saying from the Analects of Confucius, you know, the Luinyu, uh, including the, the, the strange point about uh, you should never travel for, far from home because to be filled from your parents. I mean, strange quote to put on an airplane. But anyway, um, in many parts of rural Shandong, you have uh, Confucian values uh, being trained, uh, being educated, promoted by village elders. Texts like the Di Zigui, a Qing dynasty text designed at young children are taught all over in villages and schools. Um, and there's sociologists like Anna Sun, who's at Duke, she traces the revival of Confucianism very much to Shandong province and to the rituals being revived in Chufu, including the Confucian temple in Chufu. And recently there's an institute, a national institute in Shandong um, called the Zhengde Jiaoyu Xueyuan, which we can translate as the Academy for the, it's, it's hard to translate these and make it sound, you know, uh, in English, the kind of, it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but anyway, let me translate. Education for the Evaluation of Virtuous Public Officials um, has been established in Shandong near Chufu in order to train. It's run by, of course, by the Chinese Communist Party, but it's meant to train public officials in Confucian uh, values. Um, I see it very much at Shandong University. Um, part of my mission there was to promote Confucianism, to hire more professors, who were, and I was hired arguably because of my earlier work on Confucianism, uh, promote, teach, promote professors who can teach Confucianism. We had an earlier idea to make teaching of the Analects of Confucius compulsory for all students. It has yet to be implemented, but only in Shandong uh, University, I think, um, would we have this very, very strong commitment to Confucianism. I mean, if you go to other parts of China, Arguably, the further you go from Shandong, uh, the less intense the commitment to Confucianism. Okay, so I'm going to end here about this first part, and I'm going to talk about the communist comeback now, which is more recent, strangely enough. And I, I mentioned earlier that I wrote in 2008, I wrote about the kind of the end of Marxism in China. Um, of course, that was completely wrong. At the very same time, it was the beginning of the revival of Marxism in China partly in response to the global financial crisis when many intellectuals and government officials began to view capitalism as a source of the problem and turned to Marxism as a way of making sense of the problems of capitalism in this serious way, where it wasn't just kind of chanting slogans about you know, Marxism as a guiding ideology, but really engaging with the Marxist tradition and the works of Marx in particular in a serious way, as a way of making sense of the problems of capitalism. Um, and uh, since, I mean, since then, the revival of Confucianism has become much more uh, intense. And since 2012, uh, President Xi Jinping himself has reaffirmed str very strongly the Marxist essence of Confucianism. Sorry. The, Marxist essence of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and things like the common prosperity, uh, it's not just a slogan. I mean, it's this view that we have a very strong obligation to eliminate poverty and to reduce the gap between rich and poor and polarization of society. Um, and this has, it, this, it, it's very, it very much is very much consistent with Marx's idea of lower communism which is from each, the famous slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his contribution. The point here is to reward hard work and equalize starting points so that regardless of family or class background, you'd have an equal opportunity to make it in society so long as you work hard and you contribute to the economy. These, and these sorts of ideas help to explain what's going on in China. The crackdown on, you know, if you read the Financial Times and the Economist, of course, it's all viewed as, oh, it's so terrible. But within a Marxist framework, it makes sense. The point is to equalize uh, educational opportunities. And if you have, for example, private 
um, educational uh, companies that allow rich people to have an extra edge in the educational system to hire the best teachers and to make their kids go to the best schools, that provides a very strong element of unfairness. The crackdown on, a, on, on, on technological companies, again, is meant to ensure that the government has the ultimate guiding uh, hand in the economy to ensure that the aim of common prosperity is pursued um, for all. Now, whether they did it in a competent way is second, uh, is a, of course an important question, but in terms of ideals, we have to understand that these things are very much driven by a strong commitment to Marxist tradition and to the view that we're reaching a stage where we need to move beyond this kind of reckless form of capitalism. I mean, so many people say, oh, this is because of Xi Jinping himself, his views about his strong commitments to Marxism, but actually it's very much consistent with Karl Marx's theory of history. Karl Marx was very, very clear that societies, before they move on to a communist stage, they need to go through a capitalist period, which will be very ruthless and brutal. But what's the good side of it? Well, only capitalism can develop the productive forces, meaning the level of technology and the knowledge that allows us to make use of that technology to the point that there's a material foundation for a communist society. Why is that? Well, because in a capitalist society, there's a constant incentive for capitalists to improve their technology uh, so that they could become more efficient, make more money. Because, so that drive has the byproduct of developing the productive forces overall in society and providing the foundation for communism. Now, what's so good about communism? Well, actually, it's a beautiful ideal as well. It's the idea that all human beings would be freed from the need to engage in dirty and unwanted labor and then free and then free to develop their creative talents. And but in order to reach that stage, we need to go through this ruthless period of capitalism so that people will be freed from the need to engage in dirty and unwanted labor and then advanced machinery would do the necessary and unwanted labor. And only then could we move on to this stage of higher communism, which is from each according to his ability to each according to his need. But there is this transition period called the stage of lower communism, or sometimes now in Chinese, it's called the primary stage of communism. And this is the view that we can't move on to higher communism right away because we still need a strong state to put down, as Marx said, the remnants of the bourgeoisie. Um, so this is more or less where we are now, the infamous phrase, dictatorship of the proletariat, where we still need a dictatorship to further develop the productive forces so that machines are highly developed and can free people from the need to engage in, in unwanted labor and also put down the remnants of the bourgeoisie. Um, now, when Marx was writing all this stuff, he faced severe criticism from anarchist thinkers, most famously the Russian anarchist Mikhail Bakunin, who said he, he agreed with the final eight stage of communism where the state would have withered away because there's no need for a state anymore. Advanced machines do all the necessary labor. We're all free from the need to engage in unwanted work. And then we can just more or less develop our creative talents without the need to be coerced. Um, but Mikhail Bakunin said, well, hold on a second here. This dictatorship of the proletariat will develop into the dictatorship of the bureaucracy. You're going to have a huge government, uh, a huge government composed of bureaucrats who are unwilling to let go of their power. And in fact, they're going to use the government to serve their own interests. Now, Marx tried to reply to that, but not very, well, let's say persuasively, at least to the outside observer, even those who are sympathetic to Marxism, like myself, you know, I, I think I'm sympathetic to both Confucianism and Marxism. Um, well, Bakunin said, you know, this is not going to work. In the short term, uh, the, the, public, the bureaucrats are going to want to hold on to power. And in the long term, there's no mechanism to provide wither, withering the state. More or less, I think here Bakunin was right. Um, we, uh, of course, now, I mean, even if we want to be optimistic, right, let's assume the most optimistic scenario that artificial intelligence reaches the point where it does the socially necessary 
uh, labor, and then all, and then humans in China and maybe the rest of the world are free to develop their creative talents. Um, but what happens then? Well, even then, there's things that Marx didn't consider. Machines might become more dominant than human beings, and there's still need for a strong state to prevent machines from dominating human beings. But even then, there's things like just it's kind of obvious, right? Dealing with pandemics, dealing with climate change. Um, there's still going to be need for a strong state, not to mention the fact that other countries like the United States are not moving towards this communist ideal. They're doing all they can to undermine China's uh, economic and political model. So there's going to be a, a need for a security state to defend China against uh, the US and other capitalist countries. Um, so even Marx himself was clear that communism won't be successful unless it's global. So I think given this, we can't assume that the state will wither away. So I'm going to just end, uh, not end, but just throw out some ideas that we're going to move towards, we can call it Confucian communism. There's still going to be a commitment to communism, but Confu the relevant question to ask about the state is not how to make the state wither away. The state's going to be here for the short term and the long term. It's rather how to increase the likelihood that public officials serve the community rather than in their own interests. And this is where the Confucian tradition has a lot to offer. Marxism, frankly, has hardly anything to offer. Neither does liberalism, and certainly neither does anarchism. Um, the Confucian tradition, very key part of it, is how to increase the likelihood that public officials will serve the community in a kind of conscientious way and not misuse public resources for their own uh, private interests or to use modern language, how to prevent corruption. Um, and I think that's very one important reason why the Confucian tradition is being revived, including in China, including communist party schools, because it's being used more and more as a way to try to think about how to increase the likelihood that public officials will, will serve the community rather than their own uh, uh, private interests. Again, this goes way back in the Confucian tradition. There's a very famous classic from the Han, Han Dynasty called the Li Ji, the um, uh, classic of rituals. And there's an ideal in that, in that text called Da Tong, which we can translate uh, uh, as grand unity. And it's a, it's a short passage, which is a very communist kind of sounding, where the society is relatively harmonious, Nobody steals from each other. Ba people's basic needs are provided for. And actually, this inspired uh, uh, Kang Yo Wei in the early 20th century, as well as Mao, Mao, Mao himself. But it's very clear in this Li Ji that even in this ideal kind of communist society, there's going to be a need for public officials with superior ability and virtue. Uh, the words are in Chinese, Xuan. Uh, uh, that even in this, there, there's going to be need to select officials with superior ability uh, and virtue. Um, so I think that I'm going to conclude by this, this point. Again, the question to ask then is, yes, there's going to be a communist uh, comeback. And yes, Marxism is here to stay. But so is Confucianism. And Confucianism can provide lots of inspiration, not just for family ethics, but even for how to train and increase the likelihood that public officials uh, serve the community rather than their own private interests. Now, what about going back to this point about the name of the Chinese Communist Party? I mean, the problem, I'm in Canada, I'm, well, I'm Canadian, uh, but certainly in Western countries, especially in the US, when you hear the word communist, it sounds like a boogie term. You know, when they hear communist, it sounds like Stalinism, it sounds like uh, a very oppressive, repressive state. Of course, that's not Marx's idea. Um, of communism. So arguably when China has to deal with the external world, maybe there's a need for a different terminology. Maybe even the Chinese, the Chinese Confucian party could be used um, when dealing with the outside world and uh, maybe keep the Chinese Communist Party as a name for dealing for, for within China. I mean, it's not a crazy idea. There's institutes in China, for example, um, it used to be called the, um, which is known, which is can be translated as School of Central Social Chinese 
um, uh, the school of central socialism, but more recently it places more and more emphasis on the teaching of traditional values to public officials. So now use this other uh, uh, word, this other terminology called Zhonghua Wenhua Xuan, or the Chinese Culture Institute. Both names are used. It's not viewed as a problem in China. There's something about the West that you have to have one name to describe things, but maybe in the future, the leading uh, ruling organization of China will have two names, one for the external world and one uh, within China. So let me end here, not end here. Again, it's, it's, this is, I'm drawing these ideas from my uh, new book. It's the first time I'm, I'm, I'm discussing them and I'm more than welcome uh, uh, criticisms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a fascinating talk. Uh, the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. I can see there are already questions there. Um, but if I, if, if I may, can I ask you uh, a few questions to first while everybody is still thinking? Actually, I have three main questions. Uh, I'll leave the minor ones aside. Um, I'll begin with the concept of Confucian communism, which really intrigued me. I, I can agree that the Chinese Communist Party is incorporating, e, taking on board Confucian elements, Confucian values and ideas. But I'm sure you would agree that communism is very much about the economy, or, or rather Marxism is, is about the economy. So, I, I would ask you about how the Chinese Communist Party is going to realize communism economically by transforming the economic base of society, right? Confucianism doesn't seem to offer any solutions to that. So that at some level, I sense a very, very strong tension between Confucianism and communism, which can hardly be reconciled. Yep, you, know, you mentioned the idea, grand unity, harmony, and it's all very well for the Chinese Communist Party or theoreticians to say, okay, harmony is a communist ideal, socialist ideal, but actually it's not. We know that socialism and communism must be achieved through conflict, through class struggle. So if you have social harmony now, how is communism going to be achieved? So that already touches on one of the two components of your uh, concept of Confucian communism. One is Confucianism, the other is communism. I quite agree that about what you said about the revival of Confucianism. My only question is that, okay, you've mentioned the Chinese Communist Party, you've mentioned intellectuals. What about the impact on ordinary people? Is that is there any buy-in? Is that is there anything that shows ordinary people are also interested or, or in Confucianism? And about the component of communism, I have already mentioned how that is going to be achieved if the Chinese Communist Party doesn't transform the economic base of a society, right? We know that productive forces alone won't, won't lead societies from one stage to another, won't lead societies from capitalism to socialism to communism. When productive forces reach a certain age, they have to trigger another qualitative change, which is the change in the relations of production. How is that going to happen? And without that happening, is it possible at all to move the PRC from the elementary stage of socialism to increasingly more advanced stages of socialism to communism? Um, thank you. Those are great, great um, questions and comments and, and um, very difficult to answer in a, or not answer to think about in a short period of time, but, let me just say first what, in terms of dealing with the economy, what Confucianism and Marxism have in common. I think they both have the view that 
and before this kind of ideal society is reached, whether we call it higher communism or datong, the first obligation of government is to reduce poverty, right? I mean, in the Confucius, in the Analects of Confucius, you have it, right? You, you have it. The first obligation is fu, you know, and then jiao, and then education. And, and Mencius, monks have made it very clear that the reason for that is because if most people lack basic material means, they, 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 they find very hard to be moral. If, in other words, they're very selfish and concerned with immediate self-preservation. It's only when their basic material means are provided for that they begin that they could begin to be concerned with family members and with the rest of society. So not so that's why most throughout Chinese imperial history, there's been this very strong tendency that the government has a strong obligation to deal or to eliminate with poverty. And whether it's providing the conditions, for example, saving lots of wheat to deal with famine or building um, dams, you know, to provide for 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 uh, to ensure that uh, f fields are have sufficient water and so on, and that's that's very distinct. I mean, it seems kind of obvious now, but if you look at the rest of the world, it's very distinctive. I mean, in the West, um, it's only in the 17th century or this 18th century that the view that the government has a strong obligation to deal with poverty became important. Um, there's a very good book called The Short History of Distributive Justice by Samuel Fleischacker. And he argues that it's only recently, of course, Aristotle and so on worried about class, but it's more because they viewed as a class difference would, would lead to an unstable society. But they didn't say that the government has an obligation to eliminate poverty and to provide for the basic material welfare of the people. That's a constant theme in the Confucian tradition. And it was, of course, it resonates very deeply with a socialist and Marxist tradition. And that's one reason, arguably, as, as mentioned, why Marxism could, I think, take hold in China. Another thing that they have in common, both of Marxism and Confucianism view the accumulation of material goods as a means, not as an end. For the Confucian tradition, it's, ne it's necessary for morality, but the good life doesn't lie in accumulating material goods. It lies in being moral, in, in pursuing social harmonious relations with the family and with people outside the family. But you can only do that if you have secure material well-being. In the Marxist tradition, money and material goods is also just a means so that we could develop our creative talents. We develop our creative talents through, create, through work through work that exercises both our brains and our hands. And in order to do that, we, have the, it's, we need to reach a stage where advanced machinery does the necessary labor. So it's somewhat different in terms of uh, uh, process, but they both view material accumulation as a means. And the ultimate good life for, is different. I mean, for Confucians, it's through nourishing valid social relations. For Marxists, it's through creative work. I mean, I think both are important. And in the modern world, we don't have to choose between them. That said, I mean, as you said, there are still very key differences in terms of the procedure. I mean, Marxists emphasize class struggle as necessary to change the relations of production. And obviously, Confucians de-emphasize that and, and, and maybe think that through maintaining some harmonious relations, we can achieve, uh, uh, we, we can move on to a stage where, um, where, 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 where people's basic material needs are provided for. I mean, ultimately, it's an empirical question, um, and probably both are true, but in different contexts, right? I mean, it could be that in the, in the 1940s and 50s, violent class struggle of the form was necessary um, to, uh, to change the relations of production, but maybe now it's no longer necessary. And what, it, what might be necessary is having a strong state that could, uh, that could have, I mean, this is a bit speculative, but that could have dominance over capitalist organizations. Um, and, and, and that might be necessary to bring about a, state, a, a condition where advanced machines do all the necessary work so that we're free to realize our, cre our, 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 our creative talents. Um, so I agree that there's differences, um, but it's more a question of how to get there rather than, 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 uh, than the end. And, the end, I mean, they have different ideas of the end, but they both agree that material well-being is, is the means rather than, than the end itself. Um, this is, uh, now, uh, what about 
Con what about Confucian? Does it resonate with ordinary people? I mean, it's a separate point, I guess. But let me just say here that, again, it depends on the part of China. I mean, I think in Shandong province, it's, there's a great pride in being the kind of the home ground of Confucianism. And that extends right through all of the diverse sectors of society. Um, as you know, there's even the descendants of uh, Kongzi, you know, the, who are called Kong. You know, there's 300,000 of them in Trifu who are obviously uh, very proud of the, of, of the tradition. Um, but I think it's, it's true that among um, in villages, you know, farmers who are educated according to Confucian ideas uh, are very proud. Now, um, I think even some, like there's, a, there's more and more Confucian classics that are being used in schools. I mentioned the Deeds of Gui, which is basically designed at very young children to teach them about Confucian values. That's being taught in, in as, you, as I'm sure you know, in primary schools all over China. Um, and that's designed not just for intellectuals, but for uh, people as a whole. Um, th that said, I mean, I, I do, I think we should just recognize and that at, at the end of the day, there is a kind of strongly, um, you know, Confucian does say that there's there's two different kinds of people, right? There's there's Jinza, you know, who could be motivated first and foremost by moral concerns. And the rest of uh, people who are typically more concerned with basic material needs um, and, 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 and it's going to be, and Confucianism is more likely to appeal to the, to, to, you know, to the former group. Um, that said, you know, and here we can draw on the Marxist tradition, you know, the more advanced machines allow us to move to society where, where people don't have to be concerned with working to meet their basic material needs, uh, the more the conditions are available for most people to be, or to aspire to be Jinza, in that case, Confucianism might be more resonant uh, for uh, people uh, as a whole. Um, again, these these uh, it's you you pose great issues, and I, I apologize for my very brief and inadequate responses. No, that's really helpful. Thank you very much for that. I certainly we agree with you, and don't agree with Joseph Levinson, who said Confucianism has been has been has been relegated to the uh, to the museum or something like that. Uh, no. Confucian values translated into daily practices, even you know manuals or, or books like Jesus Gui, uh, have a deep root. Okay, I can see there are lots of questions in Q and A. Let's look at some of them.